Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. All praise be to Allah, the Lord of the Worlds. Over 100 episodes, almost 40 different ethnic backgrounds, living in almost 30 different countries. In just two seasons, the Niqabi Diaries podcast has brought you the stories of Muslim women across the globe. Women united in sisterhood by their commitment to the Deen of Islam. Welcome to season three of the Naqabi Diaries podcast, where, inshallah, we will continue to bring you the stories of the women behind the veil. The Naqabi Diaries, our experiences, our perspectives, our voices. I'm your host, Samar, and thank you for listening. Please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to another episode of season three of the Naqabi Diaries. And just to remind everybody, alhamdulillah, we have started a Naqabi Diaries blog. You can get the link to that in the description box, inshallah. So alhamdulillah, we have another sister with us today. And alhamdulillah, it's been a long time since I've actually wanted to speak with the sister, but she's here finally. So sister, could you please introduce yourself for the listeners and tell us a little bit about what you do, inshallah. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khaya sister for having me on. Your podcast is absolutely amazing. Um, and I've been, okay. I've really been wanting to speak with you for a long time also because, you know, it's Naqabi Diaries and I went Naqab. So alhamdulillah, I thought it'd be, you know, perfect opportunity to speak on these issues that we face. But um, so I'm a Reva. Um, I became Muslim in 2012. Um, alhamdulillah, come from... Uh, a good family, um, except obviously that my father, um, he was a member of the EDL, um, which we can talk about later, but alhamdulillah, he's no longer a part of, but I'm a mother of three girls who are homeschooled, um, and just really trying to obviously instill in them this good love of Islam, um, and instill the importance of the Quran in them and really embody it in their heart. Um, so that's really just what I focus on. So I'm just sort of a homeschooler, um, and really just try to encourage my girls just to be um, themselves and be unique in a world where everybody is uh, following fashions and trends and just trying to be like everyone else, right? Yeah, definitely. So that's pretty much what I do. So um, I do work with a lot of reverts. So I work with the revert community um, on social media, um, just giving them support. And just it's is something that's relatable to myself you know I'm a Reva and I have experience in all kinds of things pre-Islam so I might as well just put that to use and help other people and you know Indeed. as a Reva myself sometimes mm. you know the reminders benefit the believers sometimes we all go for a dark time Absolutely. you know so it's good for the Reva community to come together and alhamdulillah that's just what I try and do alhamdulillah mashallah subarakallah so um can we hear how you came to Islam inshallah yeah um so it was in 2012 so my brother's actually a muslim so he's a revert as well alhamdulillah yeah alhamdulillah yeah may allah bless him so he's um he's actually younger than me he's my younger brother um so he became muslim first so him his wife also became muslim and they actually went to primary school together so it was a bit it was a bit strange because she just suddenly moved in like into my mom's home and she was you know I, I remembered her I recognized her but obviously hadn't seen her for a very long time um and she just said you know like me and your brother are married <laughs> and I'm Muslim and it was it was a little bit strange my family are like those people that brush things under the carpet my family don't really talk about things so it's kind of like she was there they're now Muslim and that was kind of it but like I said my dad wasn't my dad was always a bit strange in general like he was very at the time very white Britain is great do you know what I mean in the mm -hmm. whole this whole idea that you know you have to be English to live here and it was all like that type of thing but anyway so my brother and his wife just used to talk to me about Islam a lot and she was very sweet and I remember one time I was going out with my friends and you know like back then I used to party and drink or whatever I was doing and I remember one night my friends were outside in the car and they waited to pick me up and she came in my room and now as a Muslim, now I realise how uncomfortable that was because I was drinking, I had music mm. blaring in my room oh, no, no. and she's come in like very quiet, like, yeah, subhanAllah, she came in and she's like, do you want to try on one of my scarves? <laughs> I was wow. like, I looked, <laughs> yeah, and I thought she's so brave. Now when we talk about it, I'm like, sis, Allahumma bari, you were so brave. That dawah, mm. you just went straight in for the kill. Like, do you want to put on my scarf? And um, so I remember saying to her, oh, 
you know, I, I, I don't really have time, you know, I've got to go. And she was like, oh, please, I've got a new green one. I think it'll look really nice because you've got green eyes. I think it'll look amazing. So I was like, oh, God, I can't say no. How do you say no, right? So so she put it on me. She just wrapped this little scarf on my head and she put a pin under my neck. And I remember she stabbed me with the pin when she put it on. <laughs> and she was like, look, you look great. And I looked in the mirror and I thought, I thought for a minute, you know what? I actually look quite nice. And I didn't say anything, but I was just like, I thought in my head, I actually look really nice. I actually really like this, but I didn't say anything. So anyways, I took it off and I said, thank you. And I thought, and I went in the car with my friends and my friends were like, what were you doing? And I was like, oh, my sister-in-law, she's trying to put on a headscarf on me. And they all laughed. And it was funny at the time because the idea of me being Muslim was just not something that would ever occur. Yes. Um, so that's what happened. Found that. And then after that, basically the weekend after, they, my brother and his wife, they asked me, they said, oh, do you want to come and watch a movie in our room and have a pizza? And I thought, yeah, okay, I've just finished work. I didn't actually really want to go out that night. So I thought, okay, I will. It's Friday night. I'll come sit with you guys and watch a movie. Now, it's so funny because they ordered pizza and whatever they did, but they didn't put on a movie. They put on a lecture. Mashallah. <laughs> yeah and it was um it was I remember what it was it was Khalid Yassin uh it was what's your purpose of life wow and I don't know if you've ever seen that it's quite powerful um yes. quite a powerful yeah. lecture yeah and so I watched it and he says about women and hijab and you know that your honor and all these types of things and I remember thinking okay I, did, I thought okay this is strange because I thought I was here for a movie but secondly I thought I actually thought like everything he's saying is really nice. Mm -hmm. It's all nice. There's nothing bad. There's nothing wrong. It makes sense. Like it makes sense. And I remember sitting there thinking, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And that makes sense. And that makes sense. And I just thought, but I just thought for me, how would I ever be a Muslim? Like, how would I ever do it? Mm -hmm. Like everyone else, they can, and it's good and it sounds right. But for me, how do I do it? Mm -hmm. So that's what happened so basically I thought about it for a really long time I pondered and I kept thinking about it and I can't if you ask me specifically I can't remember but loads of little signs was coming up like I can't remember specifically but there was just little things that would make me stop in my tracks on the way to work when I was out in a nightclub when I was here like just little things made me think about Islam randomly mm. and then what happened was I was going on holidays to go on holiday every year and I had the same group of friends since I was like two years old we were going out, we were going to Ayanapa. I don't know if yeah. you've ever heard of. Of course. Yeah, it's like a clubbing resort. So we were going to Ayanapa, me and my friends. And that was just a standard. That was a usual. We did it a few times a year. And I remember at the airport, I just felt so uncomfortable. I felt very anxious. And mm. my friends kept asking me, are you okay? Like, you don't seem, you don't seem very yourself. You don't seem happy. And I don't know why, but I just blurted out, I want to be a Muslim. And I just started crying. And they're like, wow. you what? And I was just like, I'm... And I know it's kind of like, I want to be a Muslim. And it's just so funny because my friend just thought that maybe I'd like had a drink or maybe mm -hmm. I'm like, you know, there's something wrong with me. Cause she was like, you, you know, why are you saying that? Like they had no idea that I'd even been reading or looking into mm -hmm. or thinking they had absolutely no idea. So um, I just said, I don't want to go. I can't go. I can't go on the plane. Hyper I started hyperventilating. I can't go on the plane. I can't go. Mm -hmm. What if I die? I kept saying these things. Like, what if I die on the plane? Like, and obviously they're just thinking this is she's she's having a breakdown <laughs> something's mm. happening at home they don't know right they're just thinking this is strange so I really didn't want to get on the plane I remember a flight attendant came to me and was like you know we need to board now are you okay like, what's wrong like do you have asthma mm -hmm. and um yeah she thought I couldn't breathe like I was really panicking so anyway I don't I don't know why but I did get on the plane I was very uncomfortable the whole time and I thought you know what I've paid for it I'm here just relax, everything's going to be fine. So when I got there, we got there and it was really nice weather. We got off the plane, it was such nice weather, but obviously as soon as we got there, everybody wanted to go out and go drink him, mm. like leave the bags and go off and what they're doing. So I stayed in the hotel and I just said, I'm going to unpack and I'm just going to relax here. And I opened up my suitcase and the first thing I saw was the Quran. SubhanAllah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, SubhanAllah. So that basically was that was the tip of the iceberg like I literally was I was because I knew it was a sign and my brother had actually packed it in there my brother packed the Quran yeah, in my suitcase your brother, so I didn't your know brother was prophet on the mission isn't it mashallah to what I call it. he was like <laughs> that's like what a little brother to have mashallah that's amazing yeah mashallah he's so sweet and when we talk about it now he's like I don't remember doing that he doesn't actually remember but he did do it um 
so it was there and then basically from that moment I knew it was a sign I knew I had to be Muslim and I'd only been in this country for like less than an hour and I'm like okay I need to be Muslim I want to be Muslim so I, I opened I went to the window the balcony because we had a balcony I remember opening the balcony doors and I still remember this so vividly so clearly I remember looking over the balcony and I remember seeing one girl being sick there was one man like fighting with another guy they were taking their tops off and they were fighting in the street and then there's this hot dog stand below the balcony and it's like smelt just so bad like it was just people just like shouting and screaming the music was so loud there was mm. glass smashing there was so much going on and it's like the only way I can describe it is that is as if that a cloth had literally just been whipped off my eyes yeah. like this this veil had just come off and now I'm looking down and I'm, and the first thing I said to my, literally, I think I said it out loud. I was like, this can't be the end. Mm. This can't be it. This can't be life. Oh, you know? Subhanallah. So, yeah, I just remember looking and just thinking, this can't be life. This can't be it. This can't be. And then I basically said the shahada to myself pretty much like I basically at that point said you know I'm a Muslim and you know Allah whatever I need to do I'm going to do it mm. and I didn't actually know how to take my shahada I didn't know so I rang my brother and it's funny because I said to him I rang him and I'm like I want to be a Muslim and he's like what and I'm like I want to be Muslim and he's like alhamdulillah mashallah like okay just calm down I'm, I'm like I'm like how do I take a bath because you know in Christianity yeah. you know you have to take a bath it's yeah, like a ritual yeah, kind baptism, of like, you know? yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah so I thought it was the same thing so I, I didn't know. I'm like, how do I take the bath? Like, what do I do? Who do I who do I call? And he's just like, what bath? What bath do you mean? I was like, mm. I don't know. I just need to be Muslim. <laughs> and it's funny because he said, you just say it. Just say that you believe. Just say you believe, and that's it. And I was like, I believe. Like, it's just so funny when I think about it now because I was so hysterical and I was so convinced that I was gonna die in this place and that mm. was it and my life was gonna end like that. Yeah, and I was yeah. so convinced of it. I was just. I would have done anything. I've just wanted to be Muslim. I was like, how do I do it? Tell me how to do it. So um, I left my friends there. I left early. So I stayed there two days because I couldn't get a flight back. But I actually was, I was actually supposed to work there for one month. We were supposed to be working there and staying there for one month. So I left them and came back to England on my own. And basically that was it. I went to the masjid and I spoke with the imam and I said, look, I did take my shahada, but can I do it now so I can get a certificate or whatever I need? He said, yeah, sure. And then he, I remember he just said to me, like, do you want to change your name? And I was like, um, I don't know. I don't, to what? And he was like, well, it's up to you. This is your new life. You're starting a new life. Do you want, do you want to keep your name or do you want a new one? And my name's Amy. So I just, I don't know why. I just said Amina. I don't know. I don't know where it came from. I was mm -hmm. like, Amina. And he was like, he's like, that's one of the names of the prophet's mother. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, okay then that's that's what it is and then alhamdulillah basically that's just how from then um I remember my sister-in-law had that same green hijab the one that I tried on in my room that time when she told me to come in she gave it to me she gifted it to me at the day when I took my shahad at the masjid and I and I wore it that was the first time I ever wore hijab alhamdulillah I walked out of the masjid with that really nice green hijab and she said that matched my eyes and alhamdulillah that was that's basically you know how I got here today alhamdulillah that's such a that's such an amazing story like literally it's quite it, it, it just kind of illustrates the kind of um like conflict that one can go through in like you know the journey coming to islam like when you start learning things about the deen and you you're having these connections and you're feeling like this pull but you're still having that you know especially when you have this kind of lifestyle you know like clubbing and all that kind of stuff you know um it's like you because you and especially when you're young you feel like oh that's what you're supposed to be doing you're supposed to be going enjoying yourself having these nice times you know but then when you when islam comes it's like it's you know it's something that's kind of waking you up to like what the reality of life actually is and instead of just yeah. carrying on you know doing foolishness which is what a lot of us are encouraged to do when we're young where we, we have to like we start thinking seriously about the meaning of life and obviously what why we're here and what we should be doing subhanAllah so I like I really um you know I feel like 
like that it just kind of brings back my own personal memories as well because I can really relate to that subhanallah so yeah alhamdulillah so okay so, you, so <laughs> mashallah you've got your hijab on um when did the point of niqab come like how did you get into that was your sister-in-law wearing niqab um or how did you like kind of get towards that point of wearing the niqab what was your first experiences with the niqab itself Okay, so yeah, my sister-in-law did that. She she wore niqab. She did, uh, mashallah, and uh, may Allah preserve her. So she mm. she was wearing niqab, and um, so basically, I, I obviously to me, um, she's younger than me, a lot younger than me, but I obviously looked up to her a lot because obviously she was now like my teacher, like my mentor. Mm. Um, she was the only Muslim that I knew. Um, so yeah, so I remember that once she took me to the first Jum'ah, and this was maybe a week after I took my shahada. And um, basically, I it's funny now because I didn't have an abaya. I didn't have anything like that. I I was still working at the time. I was working for French Connection and I was working in Reading where I live. But I was also working on Oxford Street, London. Mm-hmm. And um, there was I was kind of expected. I was the, the assistant manager. So it was expected that I wear, you know, I had to wear skirt, jeans yes, and whatever. Yes. So it was funny because mm-hmm. at first I was wearing... Yeah, first I was wearing a skirt with a hijab and I had absolutely no idea how how funny I must have looked, but that's mm-hmm. that's all I could do. So I'm wearing my heels, I'm wearing my skirt and I'm going to work and I'm putting my hijab on. And um, at first, obviously, I didn't tell my parents as well. So my mum and dad didn't know because for me, for me to be Muslim, it was a completely different situation than my brother being Muslim. Um, I just I knew my parents were going to be like completely just especially my dad, me putting a hijab on, it it just would have been outrageous. So what I would do is in the morning, I would put my hijab on in the morning outside the front door and my brother and sister and I would keep watch for me. They'd keep watch and check if my mum and dad were coming and I'd run Mm -hmm. out the door, take my hijab and I'd go and I'd put it on and I'd go to work and then on the way home, I'd take it off at the bus stop Mm -hmm. and I'd walk about two minutes home. Yeah, and then... But it's funny because one day I forgot to take it off. And this is maybe about two or three weeks into me being Muslim because I've got comfortable, you know, at this point. Yes. And my work people know now. And I got to the front door and I had the hijab on the door. And I remember my mum opened the door and then she was like, what is that on your head? And it's just so funny because I completely forgot that that was that I was even wearing yeah. it. It's Paula. Then that's obviously going to have to tell my mum and my dad. And But yeah, so the niqab situation was that. I didn't have an abaya. I didn't have anything like that. All I had was a maxi skirt and I was literally mm-hmm. wearing this maxi skirt to the masjid and it's all I had. And I, a long sleeve cardigan on top and something I had. And, um, and then basically my sister-in-law was in the process of getting me, um, a jilbab from a place called Southall. And it was like a, a beautiful, like Somalian market. Mm-hmm. And, um, they used to make handmade jilbabs and they were so amazing. This, this place. And she used to get hers from there. So she said, just wait, inshallah, a few weeks and I'll get you one. So I've gone to the masjid for this Jum'ah and I'm wearing this maxi skirt and this cardigan and I've got my green my green hijab on that I've, that I've kept on the whole time that I love, this, this special green one. And um, and then she said, do you want to wear one of my naqabs? And I was like, yeah, I do actually. Let me try it on. And so I did. I tried it on and I went into the masjid and obviously there's a lot of brothers and stuff outside and whatever. And I came out and I thought, and it was nice because I felt like, it's just like I felt nice because I wasn't being noticed and it's not yes. like even though I was wearing hijab I was still like even at work non-Muslims men would come in and give me their number and talk to me and the security yeah. guards and they still knew me from before Islam so they were just they didn't really care that I had a headscarf on it was normal and even a few times like you know, I've gone in the halal shop like so obviously I had to eat halal now mm-hmm. so men would talk say oh mashallah you know your reverse system they talk and then you know and I noticed that I was still getting a lot of attention and I felt a bit disappointed actually mm-hmm. that I was still getting this kind of looks and and praise and you know men commenting on how I look and I, I felt I felt a bit I felt a bit sad actually that made me feel a little bit sad so I felt when I put the niqab and I came out of the message it's like no one even knew I was there it's like I didn't exist and I was like this is great this mm-hmm. is what I want you know handed and also because I thought 
And at first, actually, to be honest, the reason why I first started wearing niqab is because I wasn't ready for people in my community to kind of ask me and talk to me about me being Muslim, like my friends who I left in on holiday. Mm -hmm. I wasn't ready for that conversation because I didn't actually know much about Islam at all. Yeah. And I wasn't ready for anyone to come and basically burst my little happy bubble that I was in, yes. where I'm like, okay, I know this is the truth. I believe in it. I don't really know what I'm doing, but I'm trying. I didn't mm -hmm. want anyone to come along and, you know, I didn't want to have to explain or try and just anything because I just wasn't ready for that mm -hmm. yeah so that's how Nakab started basically I thought you know what I like that I'm unnoticed I like that no one knows who I am and I just want to carry on like that so it was nice actually walking past people in the street that I knew from school and they didn't know it was me and I thought yes. this and that was actually why I first started wearing it and I felt confident because obviously my sister-in-law wore it and it was it was nice but obviously Allah, my dad uh saw me wearing it uh one time and obviously it caused a big issue in the family and you know that's basically how it ended in my dad not speaking to me for you know over five years so so were you still living at home at the time yeah so I was so I was living at home um, when I first became Muslim then I basically decided look I want to know about Islam I don't know anything and I moved to London East London and I went and yeah. studied at a place called Taiwan mm -hmm. and it's just behind my chapel masjid in uh, so East London yeah. and I yeah, it was really good. So I got married and um, I was in London, East London. And um, I just just basically learned Tajweed. I learned how to, you know, read the Quran. I learned some fiqh. Like I learned basic stuff that I would should know and needed to know. Yes. And I and from, from that, I just became more and more in love with basically everything. More in love with Jilbab, more in love with, with Naqab, more in love with just everything in general. So um. It was really helpful, I think, as as myself as a reaver, that I took that step and I did that. And I did have a lot of support because obviously people could tell, you know, people know you're a new reaver. It's very apparent <laughs> that yes. you're a new reaver. Um, you know, you're like a fish out of, you know, water. But um, so that's what happened. And so I moved to East London and then I got divorced after about a year or so. And so I moved back to Reading and I was living back with my parents again. Mm -hmm. And basically this is where my dad realized that I'm wearing the club and he saw that I wear in the club because it's very easy to hide it when you're living in London because when you go to visit your parents you can just take it off yeah 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 so that's when he realized and that's obviously when he he left my mom which was not very nice but he left my mom because she was actually at this point very supportive mm -hmm. and I always I always compare her to the the prophet's uncle Abu Talib yeah, because she was very much like that and she is like that and I always that's always what I say I say to my mom mom you remind me of Abu Talib and I always tell her who he is and I always say but please inshallah before you pass away please accept like don't don't end like that be like that but don't end like that because mm -hmm. she used to even now she was very supportive of me when Naqab very supportive of my Islam very supportive of my brother always buying everything halal always double checking everything making sure things are okay mm -hmm. before she does them and just a very respectful woman may Allah guide her she's a very mm -hmm. she's a very special very respectful woman and um my dad obviously he didn't like that he didn't like that she was being very accepting very open and so yeah he left her and he joined the EDL but he was always um very inclined towards the English Defence League EDL and you know they're they're actually a, a band sort of group in the UK they're like a kind of like a racist kind of group so yeah. white supremacy group but yeah but he was always very inclined to them very interested in them, very supportive of them but he basically when he left my mum he met a woman who was actually a um from the EDL she used to go on marches and she used to hold the banners and she used mm. to do all that so I think you know you are the company you keep isn't it so Absolutely. I think that yeah he joined them and you know then it was just me and my mum and so I think Alhamdulillah that happened because obviously now me and my dad have reconciled after many many years so Alhamdulillah that's a, it's a blessing but at first yeah. obviously it's very hard because Definitely. you're torn isn't it between you're torn between should I give up my my principles and what I know to be good and what makes me happy and what's good for my my well-being do I give that up in favor of making someone else happy who probably won't be happy anyway either either way so um I think these are just one of the struggles that you go through as reverts I think it's just one of those things that you have to I think and I always tell sisters you have to put yourself first Yes, And I always say, like, if my dad can change, anyone can change. And look, he was the most 
hate he hate Islam. He was so against the niqab, so against everything, and now he wants to take his shahada as well. So I think that yeah. So I think That's if you amazing. hold firm to you what you believe, mm -hmm. Allah will always make ease for you. Of course. And you know what I like about your story as well? It you know what you mentioned about you know putting yourself first. I think like obviously you know, it might sound selfish, but that is what Islam teaches us. When it comes to the deen, we have to put ourselves first because like you don't put mm -hmm. somebody before your akhirah, like regardless of who it is. And that doesn't mean that you should disrespect other people or anything like that. But, you know, it's, it's important to make that distinction. When it comes to the deen, we have to put ourselves first. If it comes to matters of the dunya, you know, then yes, we can put other people first, but not when it comes to the akhirah being, you know, our, our, that's that's literally our future, you know, our real future that we're looking forward to. Everybody is going to face Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the day of judgment. So we can't compromise that for anybody, but, you know, mm -hmm. so it's not like, because it, obviously today a lot of people talk about putting themselves first and thinking about their mental health and well-being. And obviously that is important, but sometimes it's in pursuit of the things that are not good for them in the long term mm -hmm. either it's in pursuit of like dunya matters and worldly things and things that are going to actually destroy their akhirah so we have to obviously like highlight that this is a this is distinct this is specifically when it comes to you know what's going to be best for us in the next life which alhamdulillah is islam so how um did your father change his mind uh, about being in the edl then like what was it that kind of um it was it something that you know i'm assuming it's, it's still something that's happened over a period of time but there was was there any kind of pivoting you know definitive moment that made him like you know just state himself okay look this is my child and you know i have to accept her or whatever like what happened um so basically what happened so how we both split basically how it happened to begin with is that Obviously, I was wearing naqab. And it just what you said as well just reminds me of that verse, you know, where Allah says in the Quran, save yourselves and then your families from the hellfire. Exactly, exactly. You, know, you have to save yourself first. You know, it's like when you're on a plane and they give you the, the gas mask or whatever it is when you're when the plane is going to crash, whatever's going on, they say, put your mask on first and then you can assist other people. You mm -hmm. can't assist anyone else until you, you help yourself. So, exactly. yeah, so basically, yeah, it just reminded me of that. But um. So basically he said, you know, take it off. I don't want you to wear it. And obviously I'm a, oh, at this point, I'm a fully grown adult. I'm a fully grown woman. You know, I'm in my, I was 25 or something at this point. Um, and I said, you know, I, I respect this. You don't like it and I'll try not to wear it around you, but this is just what I do. And then I basically started getting mess. I was pregnant at this point, my second child. And then, cause I got remarried and I was getting these messages mm -hmm. and he was on the long, along the lines of, you know, when you're going to go to Syria or when you're going to go and wow. uh, strap a bomb to yourself. Yeah. Stuff all like, It was these horrible, horrible things. I remember sitting up in Ramadan crying, like crying so much, like what has happened to my life. And, and I remember saying to my dad, like I was still inviting him for iftar because my dad really likes oranges. I know it's really random, but he really likes oranges oranges and I basically said come for iftar and I'll give you all the oranges there's this really nice place near me that sell these really nice I think they were like Turkish oranges or something mm -hmm. and I said to him yeah, I'll give them to you and I remember him saying like you know like get lost so it was just these type of things and I was trying so much and he just was sending me so much abuse that it was like shocking and then um, basically he blocked me and changed his number and then um, when my daughter was born she was premature she was five weeks early mm -hmm. so I remember emailing him it's like hey dad you know um my daughter's premature I hope you're okay I just want to let you know here's a picture of her and I remember he responded saying is she going to be a muzzy too meaning yeah. Muslim right and, yeah and I was I didn't respond because I thought well what do you what do you say to that so I remember I just kept saying like hey dad how are you and cut long so short um over the years obviously lockdown happened now that was the that was the turn point because in lockdown obviously my dad came to my mind and I was worried and I thought you know he my dad is a is an alcoholic sadly um and always has been and I was worried for his well-being I thought you know and no one really knew what was happening in lockdown I think a lot of people didn't really know like what is going on you know so um I was frantically sending him an email it's just like dad you know whatever's happened if you message me today we'll, we'll never have to discuss it I love you I'm here for you I'm worried about you do you need somewhere to stay are you safe are you well mm -hmm. do you have someone taking care of you like I was just you know just kept sending him emails and then basically he sent me one back and this was in I think it was um June or July 2020 and yeah I think it was July 2020 and then he basically just said like I'm 
um, okay. Um, and I just want to apologize and say, I'm so sorry for everything I did to you. And when I think back and I realize, and I, when I just generally think back at all the Muslim people I've ever known in my life, they've they've only ever been kind yes. and oh, you as a Muslim you're my daughter and you're the only one who bothers to message me you're the only person who cares I don't have he's I've lost everything I've lost everyone and and all after all the things I've done and said to you you're still here why is that it must be your religion that's what he said oh, and then I thought yeah because he said something like the Amy I knew would have turned her back on me and it's just so funny that he said that because before Islam I was very stubborn and and it's obviously Islam refines you, isn't it? You mm. you change and tweak things about yourself that are not good because you want to fit this box of being. You want to be good. You want to yes. be righteous. You want to be pious, and you have to restrain yourself to to get there. So um, it's just interesting that he said that Amy I knew wouldn't have wouldn't have you know accepted that and wouldn't have forgiven me basically. And so he said it must be religion. So then he said, I think that Muslims are great people. It just out of nowhere sent me an email. I think Muslims are great people. I think I've misjudged you. Um, and he said, you know, I've been a fool. And um, he said, I want to meet up. So we met up. I went to London. We met up probably like um, two months after that. And um, and we went to this Turkish restaurant and he made sure it was halal. He took me to a Turkish place, halal. And he would never have gone to anywhere like that. He's a typical English pub man. You know, he's mm. he's a white skinhead with tattoos all over his face, uh, his arms or in his neck. That's, you know, that's how he looks. So for him to go to a Turkish restaurant, halal restaurant, it's like a shock to see anyone like that in there. Um, so that's what happened. And he basically, he was so proud. When I walked in, I wore, I wore my niqab, I did. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people said to me, no, you shouldn't have. I thought, no, because this is what made, this is what parted us. And this is what's going to bring us back together. Exactly, exactly. And yeah. And so I got there and he was so proud. And he was like, this is my daughter. Look, she's a Muslim too. And he was like in with the Muslims now. He's like, this, this chef's a Muslim and he's a Muslim and my daughter's a Muslim. Look, I've got Muslim grandchildren. And he was like, so like happy. Mm. And we sat and we discussed it and we talked about it. And he said, basically he was with the EDL and, um, you know, there's a lot of things that, I mean, there's a lot of them, not all of them, but most of them that they're, they're like himself, alcoholics, mm. um, anger issues mental health these types of things um which is not specific to them it's everyone's going through it but those well, you know they he had, they had those issues um and you know he said that he was involved in a lot of violence um lots of nights in the pub where people getting drunk and hitting and fighting and he said one thing that changed his mind and this is the thing that was a turnaround he said that um he was out with one of them and they were planning to attack this muslim veiled lady naqab that had walked past and one of the men had said oh or, or the women whoever he was with said oh look at them you know they shouldn't be in this country i want to i'm going to take that thing off their head or take it off and my dad said i thought for a second but what if that's my daughter subhanallah wow yeah subhanallah so um you know he said that was that was so interesting when he said that what what if that's my daughter so i guess that made him think that that made him reflect on that on that fact so um so that obviously it brought us to here and we had that conversation and um, he did ask me some questions about Islam and he he met my, I introduced him to my children a few months later and he absolutely loves their headscarves, their hijabs. He thinks they're amazing how you get them in so many colours and sparkly and cute and he just thinks they're so cute and he just loves them. And, and the one thing I love that he said, he said that you're seeing you as a mother, see how you raise them, seeing how you speak to them. He said that makes me love Islam more mm. because mm. I see that, the care and the nurturing and the guidance you're giving them like you're trying to keep them away from this dark world do you know I mean that I'm in he's like this world that I'm in is a dark world and you're trying to keep them away from it so there's so many things he observations he made that has actually made him now say that he wants to become Muslim he said a few oh. times that he'd like to he wants to become Muslim and it's really funny because I took my kids to stay at his home and it was a bit of a risk because he is an alcoholic mm. and I did have to explain to my oldest child, my eight-year-old, it's not something you really usually would have to talk about, but I said, you know, yeah. granddad has this problem. You have to be honest as well, you know, yes. granddad has this problem and, you know, you might see him do some things, but we're going to try our best to keep away and he's promised mm. that he's going to try, blah, blah, blah. So he did say, I'm really going to try and I'm not going to drink in front of anybody and, you know, but it's when someone's an alcoholic, it's, it's a fix they have to have at some point. So I was aware that that might occur. But he was really good, actually. He was very good. My other guy, he was very good. But um, so we went there, and I remember we first thing we did, obviously he's nervous because the first time he's meeting the kids, he saw Nia when she was two, my eldest, my eight-year-old. He saw her when she was two. But the other two I had since then, he never saw. So he was very nervous, and he's, he cleaned all his house, made it all nice. And I remember the first thing he did, he welcomed them in the house, and he said, 
kids he's like do you want to see something outside in the garden and it's just so funny and he, and they were like yeah and he went look outside he said you see all this bacon all over my grass all over my garden he's like I don't eat bacon. He's like, I've defrosted all of my freezer, all of the bacon out of my freezer. I've defrosted it. And he was like, don't worry. He was like, don't worry. He's like, it's three o'clock now. The foxes are going to come at five and eat it all. He's like, all be gone. Wow. He's like, five o'clock, the foxes are going to come and eat all that bacon that's all over the grass. Literally, there were slices of bacon packets everywhere in his garden. Wow. When I say everywhere, he just flung them out. And it was hilarious. And he said, don't worry. Only two more hours and the foxes will come and get rid of it all. And all that bad stuff will be gone. It's just so funny. Wow. And then at five o'clock they did they came the foxes came at five o'clock and they ate everything and then he was like look kids look they're eating all the bad stuff oh wow subhanallah yeah. That's, that is so that is so funny and so cute <laughs> like literally so cute wow. he doesn't know it's he doesn't he knows it's haram but he didn't know what the word was he just knew he just said oh the bad stuff and it's just so funny and he had like a little buddha thing in his house and he faced it towards the wall and he was like he was like, oh, I moved that because um, I don't want you to think that's God. It's not God. Like, he mm-hmm. just so, I don't know whether he'd been reading about Islam or something, yeah. but he just he just was saying things and doing things. I was like, mashallah, you're a good man. You know, he's he's become a good man. And he's he's always had a good heart. But I think, you know, we're conditioned in this society, aren't we? We're conditioned to hate in general. But I think, obviously, in the West, people uh, have these pre-ideas about muslims and what they do what they believe and automatically they're just scared and exactly. when people fear something fear makes you behave in very strange ways when you when you're scared of something you fear something you automatically feel as if you need to defend yourself mm-hmm. absolutely and i think as well um it highlights um what like you know what i like from your story especially with your dad is like it, it, and what you mentioned about people in the EDL, for example, that many of them are also suffering from, you know, alcoholism and these kind of things. It shows that people have genuine problems in their lives, and the cure, part, part of the cure to that is, you know, being part of something. They need to be part of their family, part of the community, and for whatever reason, why they've, you know, come to these points where they have been facing these kind of addictions, you know, it's the, it's important for them to feel that there's somebody there for them there's somebody who actually cares because when we abandon people you know it doesn't help them to you know come back to like you know like what they need to be like so back to themselves Mm -hmm. properly you know to reform themselves obviously there's some instances where you may have to you know have a physical separation from that person for your own safety as well but Mm -hmm. you know you can't completely abandon that person so it's good that you alhamdulillah you kept that you know contact with your dad as much as possible even when you know it wasn't good for you because obviously he was you know sending you abuse but so finally you really went through that test with a lot of um fortitude and um you know forbearance that's that's my word of the day i think so finally being patient um, which is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like he does command us to do that in the Quran. We have to like, you know, have this kind of, um, you know, long lasting patience. You go through these trials um, with dignity and, you know, always trying to, you don't, you don't let the other person's um, negative behavior influence how you behave because, you know, we don't learn, we're not supposed to be learning from people who don't know how to act properly. We're learning from the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Like that's how we should be trying to, um, you know, copy we should be copying him and looking up to him and the, the sahaba as well so sister can i ask you a question as well about your dad of course so um like okay you said he keeps saying he wants to become muslim so why why hasn't he taken a shahada yet what's stopping him um that's a good question actually and i, I me and my brother have both spoke to him about this and i think the main thing is that he feels that he won't be good enough and obviously that's just quite a common um mm. quite a common feeling I think that we've all been for as reverse where you feel like oh I can't be Muslim until I do this yes. I can't be Muslim basically until I'm the best, most perfect person in the world but then I said to my dad look being a Muslim you're just saying that you believe in God you believe in the last day you believe in his messengers and you mm-hmm. believe that there's nothing else to be worshipped in this life apart from Allah Mm -hmm. that's all you're saying it doesn't mean that okay you're going to now be the most perfect human being on this earth you might still be an alcoholic yes but you're 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 just saying you're not supposed to be perfect you're never going to be perfect you might be an alcoholic the person here might be a liar and I might be a thief I'm not I'm just saying we all have something we all have something we can't we can't just say 
we can't just have this idea that you know I have to be perfect no we've all got something we've all got shortcomings we've all got flaws and one of the main thing that women have you know is usually we, we backfire we talk about things and we get caught up in useless pointless conversations and doing and these things and we're not perfect but we just have to always refine ourselves and try and just always say yeah Rab, I made a mistake I'm sorry that's it and I said to my dad you can be Muslim you can make mistakes and you can say you know what? I'm sorry Allah I'm sorry flip forgive me give me the strength and the patience and the ability to um be stronger and overcome this next time and that's it you make the intention that next time you want to be better but i think it's just so hard because obviously my dad wants to be the best he wants to be he's like mm. i want to be good i don't want to be like this and you know he's already he said to me before no muslim woman would no muslim woman would want me mm. and I, I i get why he's saying that because he sees muslim women as a certain level yes so he see us to be good you know and he he's never had a good woman obviously my mom is a good woman I'm not saying that but in terms of uh, religiously he's never mm. known that it's alien he doesn't know so i think i, I think with my dad it just takes um I think I just take a little bit more time and also to see more people like him. I think it is just the fact that there's not many, I don't know of, uh, revert men that look like him of his age. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And I think that's also well, and there maybe is, and there probably is no doubt, of course, but he just hasn't seen them. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, I think that's it really. I think the only thing holding him back is that, that he is just thinks that he has to be the best and he has to give up alcohol and he has to do this yeah. and do that. And obviously it's from the shaitan because the shaitan wants you to delay, 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 you know. Mm -hmm. And so um, have you, has he been to the masjid? No. So I really, I we actually spoke about this. I think just last weekend I said to my dad, would you be interested in going to the masjid? Because there's a masjid in um, London. It's Al Mutanda Masjid. And they've got a new um, kind of initiation or organization called the New Muslim Wellness Center. Yeah. And I've did some work with them and I've, I've been there and we did some filming and it's really nice. And they've got imam and they've got nikah services and they've got counseling for reverse they've got all sorts of amazing things going on for reverse it's specifically for reverse and this and i know people say oh you know why just reverse but we need it we don't have that community we don't have the uncles and aunties we don't have the advisors we don't and even such small things like i was i was talking to my daughter about it the other day my eight-year-old and it, for her as soon as she eats food the first thing she says bismillah it's because mm. she knows it from when she was a baby it's yeah. ingrained when she goes to bed she says her dua because it's been ingrained as a baby yes. but for me as an adult that only learned 10 years ago i actively have to force and remember I have to think about it yeah i have to think about everything <laughs> yeah it's not natural it's yeah, it's not programmed. It's not. And it's always going to be like that because the later you learn things in life, the less programmed they are. So, I mean, that's part of the struggle of being a revert. You act, you actively have to remember and force yourself into this remembrance. But, um, but yeah, my dad going to the masjid, I think he definitely will, inshallah. And I have suggested he he come to this masjid with me because um, I think Wasim Kempson, he's a revert, I believe, and he is the imam there. Absolutely. And also um, someone mentioned to me that there's another guy in the in that masjid that goes there my dad's age has got tattoos and mm -hmm. he's got skinhead and he you know so i and he's i think he used to be the same as my dad like drink and everything so i think inshallah that i i will um but i think again he's just nervous because he uses a lot of bad language and my dad mm -hmm. is just finds him he finds himself to be very um awkward because he likes to make jokes and sometimes they're inappropriate and you know he'll probably sort of grab your arm and give you a cuddle and he he doesn't know you and he doesn't know you. he's not supposed to touch women and yeah. he's just like that and he doesn't understand these things yet so I think that's what puts him off a little bit but we'll get there inshallah I hope it's oh, inshallah and he oh, yeah like I said he does want to and I think I think it's just amazing the fact that he has opened his heart to Islam and he sees Islam in a in a, in a better light mm -hmm. I think that's that's very important it's, it's really good I think I think um, I, I'm, I'm I don't know if you've done this or not, but try to get the brothers from the masjid to come to him if he won't go to the masjid. Mm. That's what I would do. Like, I really would try that. You know, I don't know if your husband can can make, take, take, you know, kind of get that to happen. But that's what I would try to do because it sounds like, you know, like he sounds like somebody who's quite sincere as well. And, you know, it's for me, like, it's sad when you hear that there's people that they you know, like you said, he feels like he's not good enough. And we can understand that, obviously. But, you know, that's that's a trick from the shaitan. You know, we don't want him to just kind of stay how he is and 
you know, or like, yeah, even though he might be trying every day to improve himself, like he needs, he needs Islam. And I think by having the community around him as well, it will encourage him in, inshallah even further as well, you know? So mm-hmm. yeah. Really good idea. Uh, like try to get the brothers to come to him. That's what I would do. Even if it's like a meal at home or something like that, do you know what I mean? Just something where he can feel like, oh, well, there's these people and get him to meet them outside of the masjid. Because going to the masjid is a really big step, obviously, because I think for lots of reavers, they don't know what's in the masjid as well. Like, it's like, oh, this mm-hmm. weird kind of place. Like, you know, people, like, we know what churches are like. You know, even if, like, we we haven't grown up even going to churches, we know what a church is like. We know what churches have inside of them. Do you know what I mean? But for, like, you know, being an English person and you've never been to the masjid, it must be like, you know, because of all the propaganda and stuff, it, you know, people don't know what to expect, you know? Like, they don't know what's in the mm-hmm. masjid and, like, what do you do there and... You know, so maybe that's like as well giving him some kind of anxiety about being able to like, you know, just go there in general apart from meeting people. So if he meets them outside of the massive first, like a small group of them, two or three brothers, then, you know, it might be helpful. And then inshallah, they can encourage him more to like to go. And food is always, I think food's always a good way to um to get people. Just Yeah, food. definitely. Yeah, inshallah, khayr, inshallah, may Allah guide him, I mean, because it's like, yeah, really, like, it would be, it would be really nice, and obviously, and obviously your mum as well, may Allah guide her as well, I mean, and all our parents, I mean, yeah, I mean, alhamdulillah. Yeah, I mean, alhamdulillah, and my, my nan is actually also, she's very funny, she's also interested in Islam, but she's very old, so she doesn't really understand it much, but mm. I remember in Ramadan, my kids were making badges, we were making little badges, like saying, I love Muhammad, and I love Allah, and whatever we're doing, right, and my, my eldest one, she made one saying, I love Islam, and my nan came to visit one day to come and give us some Ramadan presents, she always comes and gives Ramadan presents, she's mm. funny, and um, so my, my daughter said, oh, nan, look, I've got this badge for you, and she stuck it on her coat, and it said I love Islam and she didn't realize what it was and then I remember she called me one day she said my my old neighbor Molly said that my my coat said I love Islam wow (laughs) and she said where did I get that from and I said it's Islam and it's it was my eldest she put it on you she said well that's true I do, I do love the Muslims and Islam and everything I do love it it's so funny but yeah she's kept it on it's still on her coat she walks mm. around with it on her coat Mashallah, <laughs> that's so cute yeah wow. she's cute she's very cute my Allah God, God, God. I mean subhanAllah yeah, yeah man just to keep doing what you're doing man like seriously you're 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 blessed to like you know have this kind of um you look like like you and your brother obviously like Allah Barak, your brother and his wife really did the work on you mashallah I know they really did they really did mashallah subhanallah it's just great subhanallah so um okay apart from obviously the issues that you've had with your father when it came to the naqab and everything did you ever experience any other abuse for wearing the naqab um yeah I have I have had a few occasions actually I mean I think since I think since COVID obviously when everyone started wearing masks I think it's a bit silly to now say anything to anyone wearing a veil do you know what I mean I think it's it, it makes them look a bit silly and I, I don't mm-hmm. I haven't had any bad experiences really mm-hmm. since then and actually it was funny because during um, COVID times when we was getting on the trains and everyone's wearing face masks I, I was sometimes saying to people like as jokes like oh you look like me now and there's people who were stopping me saying oh I look like you one of you now mm-hmm. and it just became funny like a lot of people it was just this sort of playful yeah. kind of oh yeah you do you know we do look like each other now and it's normal it's fine no one's dying like no one's okay. oppressed Exactly. <laughs> it's all fine we're all communicating perfectly fine um but that was quite funny but yeah so I think no I, I had one one quite bad incident I think um when I was first when I first moved to London and this woman she she tugged she like kind of pulled it mm. and I was wearing a three lane naqab at a time with a no string in the middle so you can't pull them ones down if it was a half naqab she could have done it but yeah. she wouldn't she she sort of pulled it and nothing happened really she was like oh uh we don't we don't wear those here we don't like those here she pulled it and um I just you know I was really upset and I just said to her you know you're absolutely ridiculous and what a horrible thing to do and you know why would it ever be I said would it ever be acceptable for me to come and just like pull your top off like pull your top down it would never be acceptable you know so why is it acceptable for you to take my remove my clothing why are you so desperate and I think I remember just saying something like I was very emotional I was like why are you so desperate to remove my clothing (laughs) and I just thought 
it's just it's just ridiculous isn't it because you want you want us to you claim that you're doing it out of this care and you know you mm. you're so worried that we're being oppressed and whatever it is then you know but you're physically putting your hands on me and exactly. physically removing my clothes and taking, you know I mean? make it, just, taking part it, in the oppression basically yeah of course and so that was the occasion and there was another occasion it was very long time ago and and it was really bad actually and and you know because obviously we're human beings isn't it and it always reminds me of when the prophet uh, mm-hmm. was salam, and he was um i think he was praying and i think one of the tribes came past and they said something to him or they threw something on him and fatima and her she got very angry and she started shouting and you know she become irate and mm-hmm. it, it was kind of like that situation like i was walking down the road and this this woman and this man said oh look oh look kids to their kids oh look there's a, there's a letter box yeah. look kids they kept saying look there's a letter box they're like which one of you wants to post a letter kids go on you want to do it and it's this typical sort of like you know they call them karens it was like a karen family yeah. and um and so anyway it was obviously it's not nice and then so i remember saying to my kids oh look kids look there's ignorant people look kids they're <laughs> ignorant and i remember just saying oh look look Mashallah. yeah and he was like where mummy where's ignorance where's ignorance and i was like look look kids there's an ignorant i'm saying to my eldest one and and i remember that was her word of the that was her word of the, the, the next six months to come she, wow. that's all the words she used everything was ignorant it was so funny and i remember i had to sit down and say to her that although you saw mummy do that and I, I was trying to have open honest conversation with them I said mm-hmm. although you saw me react and say that it probably wasn't um correct and it was probably better for me to not say anything and you know obviously we are humans we do make mistakes and I ask Allah to forgive me if, if I you know represented his dean wrong and you know obviously I'm just a human being so and I and I tried to explain to her that the only reason I said that in response was to try and it was for education to educate yes. them and yes. for them to feel how I felt yeah you know exactly I'm not well, saying it's correct but this is i mean i suppose it's like for like you know you know subhanallah so mm-hmm. you didn't you didn't go overboard that's that's my opinion anyways is my take on it because people need to think sometimes you do need to say something for somebody to think um about the actions that they're actually doing you know it's not all mm-hmm. the time that you can just like keep quiet about it basically especially when you are facing a type of abuse so alhamdulillah like maybe you know, maybe that that what you said to them made them think about you know their ignorance basically. Subhanallah. So, yeah. yeah, and so I think also important. to hear that you speak things. English. Exactly, exactly, because that's one of the things they when you when you wear the naqab, people automatically assume that you're not from the UK and you're not speaking English. You know, and it's like it's really um quite ignorant to be honest, because there's so many people in the UK who don't wear the naqab and who don't speak a word of English, and they're white as well, even. So, you know, you don't have to be any particular color of skin or, you know, have any particular dress style to not actually be fluently speaking a language. And people need to think more about the perceptions that they have towards um, people with a particular look, you know? And it's like, that's that's like the side of the Muslims as well. Do you know what I mean? So it's like, it's not even even just non-Muslims that do that. It's, It's all the way around, you know? um yeah definitely yeah but I did have a really nice experience as well and this one it always sticks in my mind and I was with my kids and I was walking down the road and this man and he walked past me he was only young he's probably like in his 20s mm-hmm. and he went he started clapping he went go on girl go on he's like keep representing your religion keep doing it he's like power to you power to you and he was shouting it and he was clapping he was like keep doing your thing he's like, i support you he's like i'm not muslim but i support you so i love it i love it keep wearing your veil and he just as he was walking down the road he's he's still shouting he was like keep wearing your veil never take it off and he was like more power to you god bless you and it's so funny and, and i was really emotional actually because i thought you know what if I, I I don't know what state of mind I was in I can't remember but if you were having a bad day that's just yeah. enough to turn your whole day around isn't it yeah. and just make you think yeah I am going to go on I am going to continue and I thought as well it was like a sign from Allah isn't it just keep going keep continuing you know just have someone who's not Muslim say that and there's, and there's been other times where women have said oh I love that color it looks amazing mm-hmm. on you or oh your eyes lovely oh I love that thing it makes your eyes look nice like so there's people who do say nice things and although like you get the negative things you get a lot of people who say really really nice things and 
there's been like people before who said to me, oh, I'd love to try one of those one day when, when I go to Saudi Arabia. Because, you know, a lot of people are not Muslim. They go to Dubai, they go to Saudi Arabia, it's they exactly, go to yeah. um, Egypt. And a lot of them really want to try it and they like it. But they feel like they can't. And I always say to no. And I actually thought about this doing a stall. And I thought it'd be a really good idea. And I was going to do a stall because I've seen a lot of people do it in Europe. And I was trying to plan it and work how it would, how I'd do it and make it safe. But I was going to do a stall where I'd say, look, women, people could come and just try on try it on and like take yeah. a selfie whatever they want to do because that's what the world we're in now people take selfies and I thought you know just people just a casual store where people could come and actually just put it on and just see how they feel and just see what it's like to be you and you can actually just just so people realize you can actually have a normal conversation it's just yeah. a piece of cloth it's not stopping you from talking it's not stopping you from being yourself it's just you know and I thought I wanted to do that because a lot of people do often say to me they like it and you know they'd like to try it so I thought you know It'd be a nice also for education as well to see a Muslim woman herself representing the Nakaba herself and not being spoken for on behalf of a man, mm -hmm. you know, because I think that's what the issue a lot of people have. I think a lot of the issues people have is that they they don't like that the men are speaking on behalf of the woman in regards to how she's covering. I think they like it when they see a Muslim woman who's being herself, who is, you know, they've got a personality, yeah. can have a conversation. Do you know what I mean? I think mm -hmm. that that really makes a big difference in how people perceive naqab and perceive muslim women as well absolutely definitely that's that's why it's important to you know if i mean it's not for everybody obviously but you know that's why it's important if you can do something like having this kind of um like obviously like why i started my podcast even like having these kind of platforms where you can have these discussions so that people can see like you know we do have a personality and you know a life basically and you know we're not oppressed and all this kind of stuff we don't fit into these stereotypes that people are kind of trying to put on us because um you know that's one of the things that when I before I started doing the podcast people other Muslims it were people other Muslims they say oh you know you're not like other Naqabi sisters and I used to think like I, I know that's not true like they used to say like oh you do this and you do this and they do this and I thought I can't be unique I'm not special do you know what I mean I'm just a regular woman so Therefore, there must be a lot of other sisters wearing the carbs that are functioning like human beings and just living regular lives and, mm -hmm. or, or even, you know, maybe not regular life. Maybe they're doing something like really like outstanding and different and amazing. So, you know, it's important to highlight these kind of things, you know, when we get the opportunity and obviously in, in a halal way, alhamdulillah. So um, mm -hmm. since... Um, uh, okay so you know you were meant to travel earlier on um, because obviously you were talking about your journey to Islam but have you done any traveling as a Naqabi? So I went to Spain okay yeah I went to Spain I went to Spain in 2016 mm -hmm. so I just went to yeah I went to because uh some of my some of my family are from Spain so I went to Spain mm -hmm. yeah I went for a week and a bit i I found it perfectly fine. The place I went to actually, I noticed there was a lot of Catholics. So, yeah. um, and a lot of the older Spanish women actually cover their hair. You see a lot of the older Catholic women yeah. in Spain. They actually wear like some kind of head, kind of oh, I don't know, like a bandana. I'm not really sure yes, what it is. Yes. But it's kind of like a, kind of like a hijab almost. But um, yeah, I, I found it perfectly fine. On the the airport on the way there was fine. The airport on the way back. I mean, a lot of Nakabis probably have the same issue. They stopped me and they asked me where I've been. <laughs> I said, I've been to Spain. Um, they asked me, have I crossed borders? Well, have I done this? Have I done that? Obviously not. Um, and I think, you know, they asked me why I'm, why I'm haven't taken off my veil in the airport. I thought, well, I don't have to. Exactly. Is, I do have to. I don't, I didn't know that's something you have to do. But um, yeah, I think that was it. And I think a lot of people in the club probably sisters get the same problems. I'm not sure. But yeah, apart from that, that's the only time I've been to Scotland and that was fine. Scotland um, is amazing. People in Scotland are so welcoming. And I'm mm. actually, you know, you you know, Aisha as well. Yes, of course. Yeah. Scottish, yeah. Um, yeah too. yeah and she obviously mashallah she's representing naqab and she's in scotland and you know she's she's doing great things and we actually met in london we went and we had coffee one day we went and met each other in london and you know i think it's it's nice isn't it like i really love scotland and i think the people in scotland are very very nice and i've had really good experience in scotland people well, just being very friendly very nice and yeah so i've not really travel i've never been to a muslim country sadly but i do want to inshallah oh, no. um but apart from that no since i've been muslim i've only been to spain and scotland so but i've had both really good experiences so 
Hamza Lai, it's been it's been really nice, especially on the train up to Scotland. That was really nice. I mm. I spoke with a lot of very interesting people, and I just find that generally people in Scotland are way more friendly and they way are. more approachable than people they here. Really I'm not sure why. I don't know why. I, I don't yeah. know why either actually I, I just I love Scotland as well I, I just find it amazing like I really wanted to live there for like a while though you know I was trying to like see if I could move there it didn't happen but alhamdulillah yeah I love Scotland yeah alhamdulillah yeah, so um, um would you describe the Nakab as being a barrier and if so in which sense oh no 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 not at all from for me no because I think that even look we're having this conversation right now if I didn't know you wore niqab we're having this conversation perfectly fine it doesn't matter like you know especially during lockdown as well I think a lot of people were making friendships through the internet and it's not face to face it's yeah, exactly. it's through usually and it's been through conversation and typing and so I think that and usually if you look at people's display pictures, you know, they've usually got their cat or their mom or their, you know, their favorite plant or picture of some, something random. It's usually not themselves anyway. And people communicate perfectly fine without seeing each other's faces all the time, every day, for hours on end, through emails, through social media. And I really try and highlight that to people when, when I hear people say that. And I remember a lady in Tesco asked me that exact same question you said. She was serving me at the checkout. She said to me, do you think it is? And I said to her, no. She was wearing a face mask at the time. And I said to her, me and you are having a great conversation and we're communicating very well. There's absolutely no barrier at all. The only barrier is that you can't see my body, but do you need to see my body to talk to me? Exactly. Because if I called you on the phone, you wouldn't need to see my body mm. it would be fine so I think it just depends how you see it if you want to make it a barrier then it's a barrier if you don't then it's not yeah, alhamdulillah. it's I think it's that simple but for me it's never been a barrier no alhamdulillah and I completely I just be myself I talk to my neighbors myself my neighbors are all fine with me everybody I come across all fine with me I think it's just that like I said if you want to make it a barrier then it'll be a barrier and I, I think obviously sometimes I do think sometimes when, and it's obviously everything is, everyone's different, isn't it? And I remember when I was filming, I was filming a, a documentary with the, um, it was with, I can't remember if it was Channel 4, BBC now, I can't remember who it was, but I went up to Luton and we were filming and it, it was the same lady who filmed the Big Fat Gypsy Wedding. I don't know if you heard of it. Yeah. yeah. But um, she filmed the Big Fat Gypsy Wedding. And so basically she was, we were filming and she was, we were doing a little set about Islam and, and whatever and then she basically after the filming she came to me and she said to me I love your energy and she was like I love how funny you are she said that take we had to do that take three or four times because your laugh just made us all laugh and she said like you know the fact you're just sitting there you're, you're sipping your coffee from under your nakab and you're talking to the staff in the shop and you're just being just how anyone would, would be if we were recording and she said I really like that I've actually never met anyone who wears a face belt that's so outgoing and she said to me are you uh, are you all usually like that and I thought about it and I thought, well, I, I'm not sure. I don't know. I, I mean, a lot of the people I know, are, everyone's unique, isn't it? Some yes, people are exactly. shy, some people not. Some people confident, some people not. That's the beauty of being a human being. We're all different, alhamdulillah. But I said to her, I think sometimes as well, I think sometimes where when some people wear naqab, I feel like maybe some people think as if they can't really show them themselves, yeah. their personality. They can't mm -hmm. really, or they don't know how to let that shine through. And I think that maybe that might be why people have these ideas sometimes that, you know, that maybe they don't know how to show their personality or maybe they, they're afraid to, or maybe they, they, they think that they can't, I'm, I'm not sure, but, you know, she did ask me that question. I said, I'm not really sure, but, you know, I'm glad that you said that. And she said, it's nice to see someone who's, who's young and you're wearing the veil and you're being modest, you're following religion, but you're also very funny and very I can talk to you and you're you know you're taking direction and we're we're going for coffee and it's just very normal and you know she's I like, seen you pray and it's just very nice so I thought I thought about it and I thought I don't know I think that sometimes people just think that they have to be a certain way because they wear naqab but I think you know you wear naqab because you want to preserve your your modesty and be and have haya and obviously everyone wears naqab for different reasons right mm -hmm. but I'm just saying for me my my personal opinion is that I think it's okay to show who you are. And I think it's okay to have your personality for people to know your personality. And I think it's, I think it's actually beneficial, especially in your, in the West where people don't understand Naqab, they don't understand why you're doing it. And they think that you're just this kind of afraid, oppressed, very withdrawn, forced woman, poor woman, who's been told by her husband that she has to wear it and she's, there's no other choice in her life. 
do you know what I mean so I think Absolutely. that you know if you feel comfortable enough it's good to have these conversations and show people that you you know you if you're a bit funny you know well, you're I funny that, if that, you're... that's the thing as well I think that's why it's important that you know like you know that's the thing with living in the UK if when there's opportunity for us as Muslims to actually you know interact with people we interact you know and I think it's you know I think that people have these perceptions um incorrectly most of the time because I mean even from your dad's experience he said that he's he's all the Muslims he's ever known they've always been nice to him so how did he end Mm -hmm. up kind of you know joining EDL and you know kind of going the opposite direction and you know getting involved with these kind of people it's like people as I said they want to be part of something and it's easier sometimes when you have some issues within yourself to make somebody as the other and try to like you know categorize certain problems that you think um, are going on in society or that are going on in society or even in your own life you put that category of problems into a box and then you and then you attach it to you know a certain group of people for example that they're the problem that it's like it's like this because of this you know it's like as as human beings we're looking for solutions we're looking for answers to questions and sometimes we don't know the answers to questions but we're seeing the media is telling us you know this is how you should think um this is like that because of this so we've been told um non-muslims have been told especially that muslims don't integrate and I can't think of a, one of the bigger lies that they tell people on the on the news because Muslims were very well integrated, so much so sometimes that you probably don't even know we're Muslim half the time. And that's unfortunate because we haven't been, a lot of us don't practice the religion. So there's Muslims that are so integrated, you don't even know they're Muslims anymore because they're not even practicing Islam. So they've completely abandoned even what they should be um, practicing as the religion itself. And that's led to Muslims also having some kind of inferiority inferiority complex where, you know, we feel we can't speak up and um, be practicing Muslims and take part in, you know, activities in the community that are halal, you know, because we don't need to participate mm-hmm. in things which are haram in order to be integrating. We just need to be clear and say, well, this goes against my value. So, you know, you do you, you have your Christmas party at work, I'm not coming because I'm a Muslim and that goes against my principles. But when we're having, for example, an office day where we're bringing in food from different cultures, yes, I'll bring my dish of biryani or whatever I'm going to bring in. And we can, you know, share things and share um, different information about different cultures from that perspective. I can tell you about halal meat and why we eat, um, why we don't eat pork, for example. There's, you know, integration is more than just you copy what other people are doing. It's nothing to do with actually. It's about you living your life Mm -hmm according to the principles that you follow but you educate other people as to what those are so people understand and you get an understanding of people as well instead of being afraid of somebody because they're doing certain things and having these negative perceptions because as Muslim women we can mix with other women we don't have any issues with that but you know it's that when we have this us and them mentality you know people will think oh, well, you know, these women are this particular way. And it happens in the Muslim community as well. You know, I mean, I'm leading to my next question, which I was going to ask you, do you think that sisters who wear hijab get treated differently from sisters who wear the niqab? Because one of the things that I used to see even before um, starting to wear the niqab, sisters, um, you know, who didn't wear the niqab would often make comments or remarks about sisters who wear the niqab saying saying similar things. So what, um, you know, this this non-Muslim lady has said to you about your personality, they used to say things like, oh, you know, you Muslim, the niqabi sisters, they don't talk to sisters who don't wear the niqab or, you know, they think they're better, you know, these kind of things. They used to say stuff like that all the time. And I used mm-hmm. to think to myself, well, actually, I don't agree and they used to say, for example, oh, if you give salam to an Akabi sister, she doesn't respond, or they don't get, they don't, um, they they actually used to say, um, if you give, if you um see um Akabi sisters on the street, they don't give you salams. And I said, and I so I used to say, well, have you tried giving them salams first? And they didn't respond. And the answer would always be no. So it was like they were waiting for that sister who's wearing an Akab to give salams to them first, mm-hmm. but they wasn't initiating. And you know, as the Sunnah is you know, that one of the rights of the, the Muslims is that you greet them with salam when you meet them. And the one who initiate the salam, you get more reward. So it's on individuals to initiate. And if um, if you, you can't just, you know, put everybody in the box, like you said, people have different personalities. So maybe that Nekabi sister, maybe she doesn't speak English. 
maybe she does speak English, but she's really shy. Maybe it's her first day wearing the niqab. Maybe, you know, she doesn't have many friends or she's been feeling oppressed because people in the community don't want to accept her because she's chosen to wear it. There's hundreds of reasons why she might seem to you as somebody who's withdrawn or not outgoing, Mm -hmm. you know, so it's, it's down to personality. Like you said, I mean, for us being raised in the UK, me and you, we might have similar personalities, but we might have completely different personalities, even though we've been raised from maybe similar backgrounds, similar, um, you know, we could have been raised on the same, I grew up on a council estate, for example, do you know what I mean? And if I, if I've grown up next door to somebody else from the same background as me on the council estate, doesn't mean we're going to have the same personality, doesn't mean we're going to, mm-hmm. um, you know, interact with people in the same way. So people need to have this understanding of, of human beings in general and stop like generalizing so much, you know, give people more freedom. Sometimes it takes people time to warm up as well to others, you know, to be able yeah, to of course. come out of themselves. So in a, in a first time interaction, that might be quite difficult. You know, and especially depends on the setting as well, where you are, you know, who's around that might make somebody feel more or less uncomfortable. Uncom- so, yeah, like the- these things need to be considered, to be honest. Yeah, it's fun yeah definitely. And I definitely know, I-, I remember very well people saying those types of things like, oh, Naqabi sisters don't say salam. And I was like, when you say Naqabi sisters, you're saying your sister in Islam, another believer, another Muslim mm. who believes the exact same thing as you do, who's only just got a slightly little bit more layer of covering than you, now you're saying they don't say salam. But you're, but you, you're, they're saying that it's because they think they're more righteous. Mm. But if they thought they're more righteous, then obviously then they would be doing all the extra things, exactly. right? So it doesn't really make sense. I think it's just, it's just um, trying to find a fault and, and put people down, isn't it? And I think as well, when you, sometimes people act in jealousy as well. Sometimes people act, they think, you know, I wish I could, could have the confidence to wear that as well. Not everybody. It's not that everyone's jealous, but sometimes mm. it is like that. Sometimes when someone's doing well or someone's got the confidence to do something or when someone's standing up and, you know, they're doing something that the, most people are not doing. Sometimes you look at them and think, oh, I wish I had that confidence mm. i wish i could do that or you know like and like you said or it could be that people have these even sisters have these conditioned pre kind of strange ideas like i've had sisters before say oh well my mother was forced to wear naqab in lebanon yeah you know I mean? well that's that's a political issue it's not a religious issue that's these are political things these are where exactly. the people who are running the country politically have made a decision that they're enforcing this right mm-hmm that's that's the country's law well this country is forcing you to say that, okay your children have to learn about lgbt in school exactly i mean it's, it's a political thing it's just it's how it is you go to any country in the world and they'll force enforce something you know china enforces the one child rule so every kind of country in the world enforces something it's not religiously motivated it's politically it's this exactly. something that they that's, decide that's to choose mm-hmm. you know yeah, subhanAllah. So have yeah, you, have so you ever I met think, any sister who's um, been forced into wearing the niqab? I've never met anyone. That's me personally, no. Since I've been Muslim for 10 years, I've never met anyone who's forced. Never, no. Yeah. Maybe there is. I haven't met anyone. I've mm-hmm. I've met people who've said, oh, my husband, you know, he, he thinks I'm very attractive, very beautiful. And he, he, you know, he wants me to wear a niqab and, you know, he's really um jealous and you know he wants me to wear it and they've been happy to wear it and it's it's not been forced they've been happy and you know they want to they love their husband very much and the husband loves them and whatever but i've never actually met anyone who said to me no i've been i'm being forced and you know i can't take it off i'm forced and they're making me no personally no not to say there isn't of course there is somewhere but i've never come across it have you no i haven't i haven't myself no i haven't and what about um so strange isn't it yeah, it is. But because like, you know, it's like the exception has been made the norm. And I think that's one of the problems in our um, society. They try to make the exceptions the norm all the time and push it as being that's what the standard is. And it actually isn't. It's the opposite. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, OK, so in the beginning, you did mention as well that you used to kind of do the opposite of what a lot of school Muslim schoolgirls have done, which is like with the hijab, for example, because that always makes me laugh when I hear of sisters who had to like, you know, put their hijab on secretly, like, you know, or put their niqab on secretly when they got <laughs> yeah. out of the house. Cause that's, and that's something that happens and it's funny hearing it. But, you know, when I was in school, I used to have Muslim friends and some of them, their families expected them to wear the hijab, for example. So they would literally take it off when they got around the corner from the house. 
and then like put it back on when they're on the way back home like so they can come into the house with it and I used to think to myself okay so like what if you're outside one day your mum or your brother your dad or whoever family member just sees you like without your scarf on like wouldn't that be a problem because like it's a bit risky isn't it you're you're out here in public without your hijab on so yeah. Do you know what I mean? I remember that as well. And obviously now I've got three girls and I understand because I it's it's obviously alhamdulillah homeschool, but now I understand because even sometimes my daughter, she wears hijab. She's eight. She's been wearing hijab since she was like three or four. She just mm. wears it. I've never said to her wear it. Obviously now she's older now, I encourage her. But before when she used to wear it, I never used to say anything. It's something she just did. But mm. now sometimes I see her, she'll take it off in the park. She'll she'll wear it for like a whole day. She'll go to the park and she'll take it off and then she'll just drop it in my lap and do a runner. And um and then I don't say anything. She's only small. But then I'll exactly. talk to her about it later. I said, "Why did you fling it off and run off? Like, why did you do that?" And she said, "Oh, because all the girls that were there, they they're not Muslim and they weren't wearing it. They might not play with me." So obviously she's conscious now, isn't it? Yeah. And I think it's normal. I think that at that age, yeah, when they go to school, when they are young and they go to school, I think that's the main reason the kids re- remove it, isn't it? Because it's not relatable. They're not seeing people they can relate to, and they don't want to make themselves unrelatable. And I think that. And I always say to her that, you know, like wearing something on your head will not make people not like you. Mm-hmm. If someone wears a hat, you're not going to not like them. Do you know what I mean? If someone wears, I don't know, a jacket, you're not going to not like them. It's a piece of your clothing. And I always say to her, you treat it like you treat your clothing. The mm-hmm. same way you would you would wear leggings, the same way you wear a top to cover your arms or cover your chest or whatever you're covering. Your hijab, you look at it exact same. It's no different. You're covering these parts of your body. And these are for the future, not now. But you're covering these parts that are not meant to be seen. And it's the same. And it's not that you remove it because you think people might not like you. Because I would say, you know, would, would mummy just, you know, start removing things in the street because people might not like it? No, we, mm. they might not like it. They might like it. It doesn't matter. You do it for you. You do it for Allah. But I think that's the main reason kids do it, isn't it? And obviously she said that a few times, you know, the kids might not play with me or they might not like like me. Or she one time she said to me, it's funny, she said to me, they'll know that I don't worship Jesus then and then they won't <laughs> like me. <laughs> it's just funny isn't it but I mean the yeah young but yeah I think um definitely like when I obviously when I first started well, like I said when I first started wearing hijab it was like that I was afraid isn't it that people were gonna well my family mostly it wasn't really anyone else it was more my family of course, but yeah. I but when I went into work the first time with my hijab obviously that was elephant in the room because nobody had an eye a clue that was interested in Islam mm. no one had a not even one inclination nothing they had no idea so I've gone into work and I've got my heels and I've got my skirt and I've got my headscarf I'm so funny now because I must have looked so funny to any other sister that saw me but obviously they had no idea that I was a new Muslim but and I think as well that's why it's important not to judge people and look at people that's and be cool. like oh look what she's doing oh look what she's doing because you know I always say like when you point the finger there's always four pointing back at you and I think exactly. it's always you just should always look at yourself and be good in it just look at yourself and focus on yourself because when you're busy looking at other people you never then you never will self-reflect yeah as I say I think that's why it's really important not to judge people because if someone had judged me and been really mean to me at that point that was a very like very crucial point in my life Mm -hmm. and I think that what would have happened what would have become of me so I think that's just it's just it's just making me actually think and reflect on myself now and me and how you know I've lived in my life and I think it's so important not to judge people and I think that judging is different to advising you can obviously everyone can always be good and advise and say oh did sister did you know did you know that you know you sh- you're supposed to cover your you know your ankle I can see that you know you're re- did you know that you should cover this or yeah. was you aware or um do you have anything like you know you can always talk like that but I think the judging is just it's not good isn't it and I think that yeah, if someone had approach, looked at- isn't it it's the whole approach like it it's because you know when you're when you see somebody not doing something correctly you shouldn't jump and make assumptions that oh yeah you must know that it's supposed to be like this or you know it's like that's the thing like it's a journey and, and it happens on like from both sides just like sisters mm-hmm. who wear in the niqab for example like I mentioned previously she you might see a sister wearing the niqab and you don't know how long she's been wearing it for and and not only that but even when people make assumptions that you know she's like maybe so righteous or something like that you don't know that do you know what I mean you don't know what somebody yeah. thinks just based on what they're wearing. You don't know how they got to the point of wearing it. I mean, it took me a long time to start wearing the carb. It took me a long time to start wearing even the hijab properly. Like I was where I was covering my head from the beginning, but I wasn't like really covering properly. I was wearing like still tight clothes and things like that. Do you know what I mean? So, mm-hmm. you know, people see me in the carb now and they'll, they'll like assume that I've always dressed like that. And it's just like, well, no, 
haven't or they'll see me walking with my mm-hmm. husband they'll assume that oh I'm dressed like this because he wants me to dress like that and when it's like well there's nothing to do with him do you know what I mean yeah oh my it's funny it is funny but I think you know I think that's like and I always like to I always like to have like a like a word of the day or like a summary like and I always think that for me it's like when you point the finger there's always four pointing back at you I think that's just such an important thing to always remember that it's so easy to point the finger all the time and every day are all things constantly, but there's always four pointed back at you. And I think that nobody can ever progress and, and improve when they, you're always looking at everybody else. Cause then you, 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 that means you never ever sit and actually really make toba because you're exactly. always looking at everyone else's problems and you're always seeing that they're sinning. Look, oh, look what they're doing. Oh, they just did this or oh, stuff. Oh, I did this. And you never actually sit and think, okay, I did this today and I did this yesterday and I said this and I, you know what I mean? And so you can't, you miss them opportunities to make toba. Mm-hmm. Mm. So your life is going by, your life is going by and you're you're not making toba for all these things that you you're eventually going to forget about because mm-hmm. you're always pointing the finger and it's always four pointing back at you. Every time you do it is always four pointing back at you. And it doesn't mm-hmm. mean that, you know, that means you can't advise or help anyone, but we're talking about when you're sitting judging and criticizing, saying this person, this person, this person, because actually we like if you want to make a change you have to start of yourself exactly. like say like when Allah says in the Quran that uh save yourselves and then your family from the hellfire. Mm-hmm. If you wanna if you want you want the people to be good you have to be good if you want the people to uh, to worship Allah obey Allah you have to do the same you have exactly. to do it first you, you have to be the example you have to, to start show doing them, right? something you have to be the change yourself exactly yeah. exactly you so that's what something. I was trying to say to my daughters you know that's what I try and say to them you have to be the change you have to be the ones who just you know don't wait for other people don't wait don't even me don't look at me and wait for me you mm. be the change you 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 be the ones to be good and be righteous and you make us you make yourselves good so that other people can good you know absolutely absolutely subhanallah so um have you experienced working with the nekabon at all have you had any kind of job outside of the home or even just general work like you know even if it's working online or i don't know have you had experience with the nekab um so i teach online right now i do um, i teach kids i do arabic alphabet craft sessions online okay. with nekab okay. and a lot mm-hmm. of the sisters whose kids sign up they don't wear naqab so but the kids find it it's fine yeah. um i choose to keep the naqab on actually just in case the husbands are walking by you never know yeah. um just to be safe but no the kids are fine with it and so that's my own experience and then um when i was working on oxford street in london wearing hijab that was obviously when i was wearing uh i remember i i told you i had that maxi skirt and i wore it there and they said no 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 you can't you, you can't wear this this is not part of the uniform you have to wear the uniform and i was looking around like in the shop like french connection what can i wear there was nothing at all i was just like I didn't have an option but then basically i decided that i wanted to wear naqab full time so yeah. i actually left my job yeah. i left my work and was wearing naqab full time that's actually what made me leave all my work and job and everything because i was you know i think i got a job in burberry um, I would, they gave me a job in Burberry. I was going to work in Burberry and I worked to Tommy Hilfiger. I worked in retail, so I, I could have, you know, done whatever I wanted to do, but I really wanted to win the club. I knew I couldn't wear it in those situations. Maybe now it might be different because of face masks now. Maybe you can, Possibly. Um, but yes. a good friend of mine, actually, a good friend of mine, actually, she works in the hospital. She's a really good friend of mine and she now works for admin in the hospital. And she, she said, you know what? I'm going to just go in there and wear my naqab. I'm going to go in there with my naqab and I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to do it. And I'm going to see what happens. If they tell me to take it off, then I'll just, you know, I'll do a face mask, but you'll never know till you try it. And she, exactly. she bore it. No one said a word. And that it's been six months and now she wears naqab every day. No one has said a single word. She mm-hmm. works for like admin in some hospital or something. Yeah. Underland, why not? I mean, you're in admin, isn't it? Like, what difference does it make? Yeah. Yeah, she also, she is with a lot of people. A lot of people, there's groups, teams, and a lot of people. But, you know, she did it. She did it. And what do they say? I don't think there is actually a specific law saying you can't wear it. I don't know. I mean, if you did get a job in retail and you ran and decided to wear it, can they tell you to take it off? I don't know. I'm, I don't actually really know if that's a, if it's a law where you can ask people to remove it in the workplace. I don't know. But I think, I guess you never know till you try. I think if the more people that try, I guess the more normal it becomes. It's like, you know, now people have, you know, the vegans forced it to be normal now. So every restaurant you go to now, it's vegan. Pretty yeah. much, you've got a vegan option. And exactly. just 10 years ago, that didn't exist. And you can barely get a vegetarian, I think obviously, let alone vegan. Exactly. But it's, it's, it just shows how much when people come together and push a change, how much it actually does make a change. I know people think, oh, it doesn't, but it really does. The more people that come together and do this and push for something that they believe in, then eventually it does make a change. Like the vegans have pushed for there to be 
dairy free this and uh was it milk substitutes for this these are things that did not exist 10 years exactly. ago barely could find anything like that but now every single restaurant you go to i think they have to have a vegan option exactly because and they that's, push that's, for that's, it and i the admire power. their drive that is the power of um standing up for what you believe in and this is where the muslims have fallen short right. when it comes to living especially in the uk i don't know how it is in other european countries but we have fallen short because yes we have halal you know restaurants and um you know halal grocery shops and things like that but it seems to be like it's it's almost like that's it do you know what i mean when it comes to living among people you know we don't we we're, we're doing this like thing where we try to you know like abandon islamic values for what is the cultural you know normal it's culturally acceptable not wearing the hijab and things like that i mean there's catholic schools in the uk that don't allow muslim girls to wear a headscarf and it doesn't make sense because the nuns who teach there wear their headscarf. So, but yet they have so-called policies that you're not allowed to wear a headscarf. And it's like that, it, for me, that is even contradictory to, you know, some of their religious practices. Obviously, the, Muslim, the Catholic girls aren't, you know, they're, they're not like kind of um, obliged to cover. But for Muslim girls who we are obliged to cover when we reach puberty, it doesn't make sense. Like, you know, you're going to a Catholic school and yet you have to remove your headscarf but unfortunately muslims send their daughters there and they think that because it's a so-called good school it's okay to allow their daughters to remove um their hijab so they can attend these schools you know and another thing i always say that you know the muslims have been in the uk for hundreds of years okay if we was using um, you know, if we was talking like Muslims all the time, like saying Alhamdulillah and Allah Akbar and things like that, nobody would be able to put a video on TV with people screaming Allah Akbar and, you know, blowing things up. And so, and then, so, uh, for, and people would think to themselves, oh, like, you know, this is who, like, Muslims are terrorists, basically. Like, people would think twice because we, they live among Muslims and the, the words that we use as Muslims commonly, they should be in the dictionary. I firmly believe they should be in the English dictionary by now because we should have been using them publicly and everybody should already know what they mean, even if they're not Muslim. The word selfie was never in the dictionary. It wasn't a word, but it's been added to the dictionary because it's been used that much. And that's it only took like a couple of years, I think, for it to be added to the, I think it was Oxford or Cambridge dictionary. So why is it that that can happen? But when it comes to Islam as Muslims, we feel you know, so we think so little of ourselves and actually ultimately of our religion, you know, that we're not, you know, allowing ourselves to express our faith properly. And we, as I said, we're trying to overly over accommodate other people. And it, it happens not just in the UK, but even in Muslim countries too. It happens everywhere. So, mm -hmm. it, it, and it, it's just wrong. Subhanallah. Yes, yeah, may Allah rectify our affairs. I mean, I remember being in the experience like one time in the masjid, this sister came to me and she was like, Oh, um, you know, haram alaikum, like because I was wearing naqab in it. And she was basically saying that she said to me, Oh, you know, we've got a lot more things to do before we can start dressing like this. And it's just like people, like when you want to wear hijab or you want to wear the naqab, like, you know, there's some Muslims who have these kind of, you know, they'd be like, oh, you know, we're not ready for that yet. We still have much more to, like, much more things to kind of accomplish. But the re reality is because of this mindset, we're already so far behind, you know, any other kind of political group or movement or whatever, because they, those people, once they've decided that this is what they're standing on, they take it like all the way till they get what they want. But as Muslims, it's like, oh, we know we, we've had what we're standing on for more than 1400 years, but we don't want to stand on it. We're just like, oh no, we can't do this because we can't do this because we can't do this because, and there's a whole list. And then we just sit in the corner, you know, not yeah, practicing our religion, oh. like to the, to, to the fullest, you know, and then when somebody does want to come and just pray five times a day, they get labeled as being the fundamentalist extremist. It shouldn't be like that. Do you know what I mean? It should be something that is like, it's just normal. I think as well, like to something that Orma Ibn al-Khattab said, and I think it's very important. He said, don't put off today's work for tomorrow. Exactly. And I think that's very true, isn't it? Like, you know, just, yeah, I think. And then obviously, obviously people always waiting for the other people to make the change. Like I said, like you, you do it first. And then the first one through the door is always the one to get, to get like hit first you know what I mean it's the saying isn't it the first one through the door gets hit first but someone and then you then you just start like a 
you start like a movement isn't it of people who then become inspired by that and then they will follow in your footsteps and obviously that's how like the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi became the most influential person even the exactly. type in influential person is he's number one of top 100 influential influential people in the world is because obviously that you know he had the opportunity to have um, all the wealth and all the riches and they said you know we'll give you everything we'll give you the land we'll make you king of this land we'll give mm-hmm. you all the women everything and to stop your message and he refused and so I think when people see that, that inspires people to also be strong. So I think, yeah, we just we just need more, uh, maybe public figures, maybe not public figures, just more people around us, and obviously ourselves. Start with ourselves to be people who are who hold firm and and to be that inspiration for other people to follow. Exactly, and that's literally that's literally all that it is. You know, that's literally all that is. We just need to be people of principles because there's a saying that if you stand for nothing you'll fall for anything so we shouldn't act like we stand for nothing because mm-hmm. you know it's not going to help us in the long term you know being afraid to practice yeah. our religion properly when actually our religion isn't bad and you know we give people the wrong idea about islam because we don't practice it if we you know st- try to keep you know we we're allowing these stereotypes to take hold because we don't practice our religion properly and then what happens as well sometimes is that people still put their cultural practice over islam and they stick to them vehemently you know even though some of those cultural practice might very well be backwards and uh, an example of that is not letting your children marry somebody outside of the culture do you know what i mean so somebody who doesn't want their daughter to wear hijab because they think that it's not going to help them get into university or have a good career doesn't want that same daughter to not marry somebody who isn't from the same country as them it doesn't make sense and that's not Islamic. Do you know what I mean? So it's like yes, you, you've given up the halal, and but you're you're pushing for something which is like I'm not so obviously it's not haram to marry something somebody from your own country, but it's haram to be racist. Do you know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. ridiculous. Yes, but you know, like I said, well, inshallah, and it's obviously inspired me. Like speaking to you as well has inspired me to inshallah try my best to be you know from today onwards to be that inspiration and be that oh, example well. you know and we will have to start from somewhere so jazakallah khair for your inspiration right, yeah, and, yeah, your... and i think to be honest you you're inspiring because your story mashallah subhanallah is a river and just how you've managed to maintain that relationship with your parents especially your father obviously you know even in those difficult times when he didn't even want to talk to you I mean he really he did I suppose took it to the limits blocking you and things like that you know it shows that you you still stay persistent in maintaining that connection because I know that a lot of reverts have these problems with their parents you know that you become Muslim and it and there's like it's, it's a really difficult time those initial years to actually maintain a good relationship especially when you didn't have one a good relationship before because some of us didn't like for if you've had a good relationship with your parents and then you become muslim you know that's that's difficult but if you already didn't didn't have a positive relationship and then you become muslim that can be really trying as well so Allah Mubarak, you've illustrated like how it can and should be done really, you know, so now your father's done a complete three, well, 180 turn, you know, completely the opposite, where, you know, he now he's somebody who wants to be a Muslim himself, alhamdulillah, so it just goes to show like, you know, you by not compromising your, um, you know, religious beliefs, your Islam at all as well, because this is also important, a lot of reverts usually get bad advice from Muslims that they should, you know, compromise islam in some ways maybe you know but i think obviously every situation needs to be looked at individually it's not a black and white issue so i don't want to i'm not trying to like generalize things here because obviously every family is going to be different so you have to be sensitive towards like whatever your family Mm -hmm. situation is as well so it's not as easy as it might sound and i know you've obviously there's probably so many more things that you could tell us about your journey in this and you know the difficulties that you've had but there's only so much time and mashallah we've been talking for ages now so far I, know, but, I, yeah, so. But I think as well like the, the note I want to leave on as well like that I know it sounds cliche and people say it but love conquers all but when you exactly. say that it really is it's true and it's like how can how long can you really detest someone how long can you really you know uh, be adverse to someone when all they do is love you and care about you 
because love is what softens the heart isn't it love is something that we all want and we all want to feel and we go through the most craziest lengths in search of it and to keep it and we as human beings just we need it to survive we need love and I think when someone gives you love and they just keep giving it to you and they keep giving it to you how long really can you really hate that person you know and it's just true love conquers all and it's true and, and that was the solution with the problem with me and my dad alhamdulillah that I just kept showing him that I love him and I care about him and I think that as long as you always show people you love them and you care about them that in their heart isn't that eventually will penetrate their heart you know because there was this one saying this teacher said he said that he was talking about knowledge actually but you can apply it to this he said that um drops of water yeah drops of water eventually over time they erode rocks little yes. tiny drops of water of you, keep, you keep dropping and they erode rocks they make rocks erode away now he was he's talking about knowledge he said imagine if you every day just do tiny tiny little bits of knowledge tiny he yeah. said imagine what that will do to your heart when the heart is not as hard as the rock yeah exactly. but but in this term i mean we can apply that as well but imagine all the love you keep yeah. giving people little drops of love there's little drops of love how long do that softens the heart because the heart is not as hard as a rock mm-hmm. you know okay so to round up the interview um what advice would you give to sisters who would like to wear the neck but they're struggling um i would say the first thing is to have it's important to have a companion that you can trust and you can rely on to go to to go to and speak to these issues about they don't have to win their heart themselves but I think it's important that you speak with people that you trust and who love you and who you feel safe with I think that's the first thing always talk to people talk about it because I think the the worst thing I think what I do and most people do we build things up in our head worse than they actually are and I think talking about it actually makes it, it puts things in perspective and makes things easier for you so I think that's the first thing secondly obviously always renew your intention remember why it is you actually want to wear it what is your intention always and you could even write it down like what is my intention for this why do I want to do this you know because I think that's important that's the that's the main focus of why you want to do it and how will it benefit you I think that's the main thing and also I think just you know just like to like we said before to focus on yourself if you believe if this is your belief that is the most correct thing to do and you're ready for it and you want to do it and you feel it in your heart then you do it because that is what is pleasing to Allah and Allah wants us to be ourself if that's how you feel that you are now this is how you're going to express yourself this is your new passion and this is how you can you know fulfill your potential to be who you really are then you do it because Allah wants us to be ourselves. he wants us to be who we are you know so I think that yeah those are the three advice I'll say talk to people that you know and you trust and you love and who will genuinely give you sincere honest true advice from their heart secondly is to um to write down and remember the reasons why and you renew your intention what is your intention for it and you know the benefit that you think it will have for you and thirdly is to just be yourself Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. so finally sister what does the naqab mean to you naqab means to me that's a good question what is the naqab mean to me i think the naqab means to me i think it means that I think it means character. And when I say that, it means that I'm truly showing you who I am, how I think, really showing you how I think and showing you my worth in what I've got to say and showing you my skills in how I present myself and what I'm able to do. That's what I think Naqab is to me. And I think that if anything, because I have always been a stubborn, very stubborn person before I was Muslim. And, you know, for me, it drives me even more to want to wear naqab when I, I want you to really see who I am. I want you to really know who I am and I want you to like me for me. I want you to, I want you to be impressed with what I can do. And I want you to, I want you to see all these things about me that you might not necessarily get to know if I hadn't worn naqab. So for me, that's what it means. It means it means character and it means being myself and it means being able to show myself in a way where I don't have to actually show my body doesn't come into consideration. I can be fat, I can be skinny, I could be unattractive, I can be whatever I want, but it doesn't matter because that's not who I am because that's all going to fade. That's not who I am. Who I am is inside. And now you're going to see that because I'm going to force you to see that because I'm going to cover it all. Yes, subhanAllah. That's so true, subhanAllah. I don't know about it, sister. That's amazing. I love that. I love the way you put that across. This is really so true, subhanAllah. 
that's what it is you know you have to really you know take time to look at the person and get to know somebody for who they are rather than just based on their looks you know alhamdulillah barakallahu feekum sister it's been amazing talking to you today and i loved hearing your revert journey especially and the story with your father as well may allah guide our families um to the straight path i mean and um i mean Jazakallah khair for taking such a big amount of your time out from your kids and you know your family life to be able to um you know do this interview for us no thank you so much it was it was honestly my pleasure and Jazakallah khair may Allah bless you and may Allah make this like a sadaka jariya for you in the future to come inshallah I'm sure like a lot of sisters especially reverts will definitely be able to benefit from this and I hope that you know non-reverts born Muslim sisters who are listening can also learn about the other perspective of you know like growing up or not growing up as a Muslim and becoming Muslim and how they can actually help um reverts as well because we do need a lot of um assistance and you know just support in general in the community is as well so i hope this gives them an insight as to you know the background of reverts and how life can be for us with um, non-muslim families as well yeah inshallah thank you so much assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh